is no it seems to say Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts be open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. God spake these words and said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy mind, with all thy soul and with all thy strength. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us, and write all these these law.
Let us pray. Almighty God, whose kingdom is everlasting and power infinite, have mercy upon the whole church, and so rule the heart of thy chosen servant, Charles, our king and governor, that he, knowing whose minister he is, may above all things seek thy honor and glory, and that we and all his subjects, duly considering whose authority he hath, may faithfully serve, honor and humbly obey him in thee and for thee, according to thy blessed word and ordinance, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with thee and the Holy Spirit liveth and reigneth, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grants that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life which thou hast given us in our Saviour Jesus Christ. Almighty God, give us grace that we may cast away the works of darkness and put upon us the armor of light, now in the time of this mortal life, in which thy Son Jesus Christ came to visit us in great humility, that in the last day, when he shall come again in his glorious majesty, to judge both the quick and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal through him who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, God forever and ever. The epistle is written in Romans chapter 4 beginning at the first verse, chapter 15 beginning at the first, fourth verse. Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one towards another according to Christ Jesus that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore receive ye one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. And again he said, rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. And again, praise the Lord all ye Gentiles and laud him all ye people. And again, Isaiah saith, there shall be a root of Jesse and he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him shall the Gentiles trust. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Here endeth the epistle.
Here begins the 25th verse of the 21st chapter of the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Glory be to thee, O Lord. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. And he spake to them a parable. Behold the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us, under Pontius Pilate, he suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets, and I believe one Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. 
A very warm welcome to you all this Sunday morning, and a welcome, of course, to those who are watching on live stream online. You're all very welcome to join our service. Um, thank you to our musicians who so beautify our services. We are most grateful as ever. And thank you to our celebrant and preacher, the Archdeacon, the Venerable Luke Miller, who is with us. And I'm going to give a bit of a trailer now. He's also going to be here on Christmas morning. So if you're minded to come, there will be a service, 10.30 on Christmas morning, and uh, Father Luke will be the celebrant. Um, what else? I think the most important thing is that next Sunday is our parish carols, and we hope that there will be a good turnout, as usual, and we will have amongst us the members of the Vintry and Dowgate Ward Club, so that should swell our numbers as well. Um, please do remember to bring presents for the children. I don't know quite what we'll do when the present pile reaches the top of the Christmas tree. <laughs> Uh, we'll see. We'll worry about that when we get to it. But it's wonderful to see so many, and please remember it. Um, lastly, with the parish carols, of course, we have refreshments afterwards. So please bring some mince pies or finger food or something suitably festive so we can all join in. Thank you. Why do I suspect it might be an excuse for a second Christmas tree if we get lots more presents? St Paul's Epistle to the Romans, chapter 15 and verse 12, and the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 11 and verse 10, there shall be a root of Jesse. There shall be a root of Jesse in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, I'm sure we all know the Advent hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, which is based on antiphons, which are the short couple of sentences drawn from scripture and devotion, which were said or sung immediately before the Psalms and the Canticles and other liturgical texts in the monastic offices before the Reformation. The hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, draws specifically on the antiphons which were sung immediately before the Magnificat at Vespers in the monasteries of England in the run-up to Christmas. There are, they run up in the last, the last few days before Christmas. Each of them begins with the vocative O, and so collectively they're known as the O antiphon. So O Come, O Come, Emmanuel is the first one, and then there's a whole series of others. Now, Cranmer removed the antiphons when he reformed the monastic offices and glued together the seven times of prayer during the course of the monastic day into two matins and evensong, morning and evening. But if you look in the beginning of your prayer books at the general calendar, don't do it now, but if you do look at that, as uh, many uh, choir boys have done during the course of uh, tedious sermons, you will see that uh, on the 16th of December, the antiphon, or just the two words, O Sapientia, O Wisdom, which is the lead-in words of the first of these antiphons, is marked in the general calendar. And that would seem to suggest a continuing reminder of the antiphons in the prayer book and that they might still have a place in the devotion of the church. Why might Cranmer have done that? Why did he leave that memorial of these otherwise abolished liturgical excrescences? Well, because the antiphons do what St. Paul is talking about in today's epistle reading. What they do is to take the Hebrew scriptures and say that they were written for our learning, that they teach us of Jesus Christ. Because each of the antiphons takes a title of Jesus from the Old Testament. And so they back up what St. Paul is saying in his letter to the Romans. St. Paul begins in today's epistle with what would be uncontroversial for all Jews, that through patience, steadfastness, that is, keeping to it, and patience and comfort of the scriptures, we might have hope. The faith of Israel was founded in hope. It was and is that the Messiah is coming to bring God's salvation and judgment on the world, to punish evil, to reward good, and to bring freedom from death. That is what the Hebrew Bible teaches. And St. Paul tells the Christians in Rome that that's right, nothing new. 
But he also then goes on to something that is radical, that does make a huge change. Because he says that all of that, that teaching of the Hebrew Scriptures points to Jesus, who was, he says, a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. And those promises were that the Gentiles would glorify God, that the Gentiles would rejoice with the people of Israel, and that in Jesus, the root of Jesse, the Gentiles would trust. So two new things, that the Hebrew Bible points to the Messiah who is Jesus, and that the Gentiles will be called in to the kingdom of God. The whole world is to receive salvation. Now, St. Paul is a great source for the O Antiphon because he takes one of the titles of Jesus from the Old Testament which ends up in one of the Antiphons, Root of Jesse. And St. Paul points out that this is taken from the book of the prophet Isaiah, which is why my text this morning has two references in Scripture, Isaiah 11.10 as well as Romans 15.12. And in that day... There shall be a root of Jesse, who will stand as a banner to the people, for the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. And the O Antiphon draws on that text, O root of Jesse, standing as a sign among the peoples. But then it goes on, before you, kings will shut their mouths, to you the nations will make their prayer, come and deliver us, and delay no longer. So it begins with the triumphant hope of the consummation, that the root of Jesse will stand like a banner, like a tall tree on a hill, or like a banner for the army to gather around, a sign among the peoples. But then the Antiphon moves on to a different engagement with Scripture. Before you, kings will shut their mouths. This is also from the prophet Isaiah. It's from Isaiah 52, 15. Another way of translating it would be, kings will be speechless with horror. Now, this is the suffering servant. And it makes us realize that the root of Jesse, the sign among the peoples, this tree on a hilltop, is nothing less than the cross. Because the suffering servant passages we read during Lent. That passage, those passages which speak of the one who is most afflicted amongst men, the one who bears our wounds and by his wounds we are healed. So the antiphon is joining up the root of Jesse and the cross of Jesus through these two parts of the prophecy of Isaiah and making the point that it is to the cross that all peoples must come for salvation. To the cross where Christ makes the propitiation for our sins, bearing, that is, the punishment for what we have done, where also he makes the expiation, that is, making us holy, so that we who are not holy may, through his holiness, enter into the presence of God, he entering so fully into our humanity, even unto death, that we may enter into his divinity, even to everlasting life. And so you see how the antiphon is piling up thoughts and ideas and concepts from Scripture, In too short a space, it gives us too much to manage. Last week, I was doing some interviewing, and one of the things that we were to look for in the candidates was the capacity for clarity of thought. It's easy to get lost in the maze of different ideas and thoughts in approaching Scripture in this way. And it's also potentially frightening. If the Bible's that complicated, then who am I to be able to open it and read it? Maybe Cranmer was right to remove all of these antiphons. Up to a point, yes. But as our colleague this morning reminds us, we approach Scripture in different ways. Read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest. Reading is the start. We are challenged to give time for reading, to read the bits of the Bible that don't come up in the lectionary for the services and to read at our own speed. And to read, I might say, in a translation which we understand. The principle of the prayer book was that it should be a language understanded of the people, as Andrew reminded me just before Mass. Now, St. Paul's Greek is not awfully clear, 
And the 17th century translators were so cautious of personal interpretation that they sacrificed clarity in preferring literal render renderings to something that would make some sort of sense. And the result is that very often, particularly the epistles, are unclear to modern ears. What is absolutely right and not to be changed in public liturgy is not necessarily right for private study and devotion. Reading. Next, the Crolic enjoins us to mark. To mark the text is to take note of what it says, to be obedient to it, to take it seriously in application to our lives. But not simply our own view, although we begin with that, but obedience to the reflection and teaching of the Catholic and Apostolic Church over centuries of devotion and study. And so the Colic goes on to remind us that we must learn, those who are members of the Catholic Church, the Catholic and Apostolic Universal Church, do not read alone, but in concert with the mind of other Christians. As St. Paul says in today's epistle, that you may be like-minded to one another. The bright ideas of modernity and of our immediate cultural context must be humble and in conversation with the learning of the church extended across cultures and different eras. When we come to inwardly digest is when we come back to how the antiphons approach scripture. Inwardly to digest is to wrestle with the richness of scripture, with the connections which it makes with itself in the way that St. Paul demonstrates in our epistle as we hear our Lord doing in our gospel reading when he says, in that terrible day, stand up, lift up your heads. There is the echo of the Psalms, lift up your heads, O ye gates. The King of glory is coming in. Devotional reading can be done on all kinds of levels. Books and learning can help us, but scripture will do it for itself and a Bible with cross references will help us to chase these things through. We know how to spot the cross references in films or how to hear them in music, how to read them in novels. We can also do the same in our Bibles. We don't need to find all of them. The whole point is that these echoes and connections are rich and diverse and inexhaustible, like in a novel or a poem, which we return to time and time again, finding more in it. Some introduction is helpful, but pile in and we see what we find. An Advent like Lent is given to us as an opportunity to do this. It leads us more deeply into the world in which Christ is revealed to the Gentiles. I've printed out a copy of the antiphons, which I pinched off the internet. There's a reference of where I got it from on these bits of paper. You might need a magnifying glass because I tried to squeeze it all onto a small bit of paper together with the Magnificat. The antiphon is there together with the bits of scripture to which it makes reference and then the Magnificat there. Maybe in the last few days of Advent, find time to read the Magnificat quietly and prayerfully with the antiphon. Maybe if you are one who says even song each day, you could similarly make use of the antiphon just on those days during those, that period. For after all, the prayer book gives us the little reminder to do it. Whatever tools we use, whether we choose to do that or not, the reading and inwardly digesting is more deeply preparing us for the day when we shall see the Lord coming in glory. This is the business of Advent. However we choose to do it, let us take up our Bibles and read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven.
Let us pray for the whole state of Christ's church, militant here in earth. Almighty and ever-living God, who by thy holy apostle has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all men, we humbly beseech thee most mercifully to accept our alms and oblations, and to receive these our prayers, which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all they that do confess thy holy name may agree the truth of thy holy word, and live in unity and godly love. We beseech thee also to save and defend all Christian kings, princes, and governors, and especially thy servant Charles our King, that under him we may be godly and quietly governed. And grant unto his whole council and to all that are put in authority under him, that they may truly and indifferently minister justice to the punishment of wickedness and vice, and to the maintenance of thy true religion and virtue. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops and curates, that they may both by their life and doctrine set forth thy true and lively word, and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. And to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, and specially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succour all them, who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear, that beseeching thee to give us grace so as to follow their good examples, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant this, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Ye that do truly and earnestly repent you of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbours and intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God and walking from henceforth in his holy ways, draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and make your humble confession to Almighty God, meekly kneeling upon your knees. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men. We acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed against thy divine majesty, provoking most justly thy wrath and indignation against us. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us, the burden of them is intolerable. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in newness of life, to the honour and glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all them that with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him. Have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what comfortable words our Saviour Christ saith unto all that truly turn to him. Come unto me, all that travel and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. So God loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to the end that all that believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Hear also what St. Paul says. This is a true saying and worthy of all men to be received that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Hear also what St. John says. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is meet and right so to do. It is very meet, right, and our bounden duty 
that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty, everlasting God. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of thy tender mercy does give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to, die, to, to, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there, by his one oblation of himself once offered, a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and had instituted in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death until his coming again. Hear us, O merciful Father, we most humbly beseech thee, and grant that we receiving these thy creatures of bread and wine, according to thy Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who, in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it, in remembrance of me. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And with thy
Draw near with faith, receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for thee, and his blood, which was shed for thee. Eat and drink in remembrance that Christ died for thee, and feed on him in thy heart, by faith, with thanksgiving. Because Christi custodit in vitam eternum. Jesus Christ, which was given for thee, preserve thy body and soul until the last in life. Take and eat this room which the Christ died for thee, and feed on him in thy heart by faith with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for thee, preserve thy body and soul until the last in life. Drink this room which the Christ died was shed for thee, and be thankful.
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O Lord and Heavenly Father, we, thy humble servants, entirely desire thy fatherly goodness, mercifully to accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving most humbly beseeching thee to grant that by the merits and death of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and lively sacrifice unto thee, humbly beseeching thee that all we who are partakers of this holy communion may be fulfilled with thy grace and heavenly benediction. And although we be unworthy through our manifold sins to offer unto thee any sacrifice, yet we beseech thee to accept this, our bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits but pardoning our offences, through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom in the unity of the Holy Ghost all honour and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Amen. The peace of God which passeth all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be among you and remain with you always. Amen.